Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to be talking about the motions of the planets around the sun. Around the sun? Wait a second. We haven't known that forever. In fact, the object of looking and discovering that the Earth actually goes around the sun is one of the central ideas to all of physics and, and frankly, modern thought. The discovery of the Earth's motion around the sun and the, uh, and the development of thought that led us to that are probably some of the most important things in what we call Western thinking. Uh, so, And in fact, it, it traces the beginnings of what we call science. All right, so what are these motions? All right, well, first, let's actually start off with some basic things. Well, when we look up at the night sky and we look year after year after year, we see that the stars rise in the east and set in the west, and they go at a certain angle depending on your latitude, but they always do that, and they always seem to be staying fixed with respect to each other in the sky. And those are the stars. But then we find that there are wandering stars, some stars that don't stay fixed with respect to the others. And in the classical terms of the wandering stars, we have the sun, of course, moon, wow, it's up there. Uh, we have the sun, the moon, we have Mars, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. So those are the classical planetas, the planets. And planet in Greek in, indicates wanderers, which means wandering stars. So the word planet, the oldest meaning for that word is wanderers, wandering stars. So what are the wandering stars? The wandering stars also appear to rise in the east and set in the west, just like all the other stars. However, they steadily drift eastward every day. So over a very short period of time, over many days, if you watch them day after day after day, you will see them dr slowly drifting eastward. And occasionally they will drift westward on what we would call retrograde motion. So prograde motion is the drifting slowly to the east of the planet. And occasionally it does a backward loop that we would call retrograde motion. And Mars shows this quite explicitly. Uh, the Mars, Mars's uh, retrograde motion was one of the great important things to study in terms of the, the motion of the planets around the sun. All right. We also know, or at least appear to know, that the planets reflect light. They don't have their own light of their own. Now, that is an interesting statement in and of itself, and it's hard to really determine that from the sky, but the ancients thought and noticed that the slower moving planets were also the dimmest. So they reasoned that, hey, if they're the dimmest, they must be the furthest. And if they're reflecting light from the bright sun, which they know they knew was happening with the moon, if the moon was reflecting light, then the other planets may be reflecting light too, and they're very close with respect to the stars. So therefore, if they're farther from the sun or farther from the earth, then therefore they would be dimmer. So that's an old argument that the ancients knew about as well. So this led to the direct trying to understand the influence of these things and what they meant. Because there was a difference between the motions of the planets and the stars and the things on the earth. Because the ancients knew, and everybody's known, that the stars have always risen in the east and set in the west. And they always have done this. And they all, so planets' motions are extremely regular. So there's a difference between what happens in the celestial sphere and what happens in the material world. The material world we'll call the Earth. And so to ancient philosophers or, or, and scientists of the day, we wouldn't really call it science, trademark science, but science or what we would call the beginnings of science, had the idea that you actually had to, the, the operating principles for the Earth were different than that for the stars. In fact, they didn't seem to behave the same at all. So if they were, like, let's get for example, you take an object like an apple and you go up a tree, and if you take an apple and drop it out of a tree, guess what happens? It falls towards the Earth. And it's free, so it falls. Well, look at Mars in the sky. Mars must be free of the stars. And if it's free of the stars, why doesn't it fall to the Earth? That's a really interesting question. Same with Saturn, same with Jupiter, same with the moon. Why doesn't the moon simply fall to the Earth? It stays up there for whatever reason. So whatever principles act on the Earth appear to be acting different, have a different set of principles that work with respect to the planets and stars. 
And so therefore, people who studied the stars weren't called, weren't deemed these wonderful notions that we call the astronomer, where they weren't even called scientists, they weren't even called physicists, they were called mathematicians. They were mathematicians who calculated things, who calculated the length of the day and the length of the year. And the principal reason for studying the stars was calendars. So you knew when to plant things and when to do things and when important annual events would occur and when important monthly events would occur. And so you would also then, if you were making calendars, you would notice that there were important events that happened in certain times. So therefore, if those important events coincided with the, with the apparent positions of the things in the sky, then they might be related. And thus was born astrology. Astrology is the apparent or supposed link between the motions of the planets and the stars and what happens down here on Earth. Well, just got to go to show you that astrology is simply a construct. It is a way that people have looked up in the sky and looked up there and said, wow, that's happening now? That must be related. In the same way that when you look up in the sky on a cloudy day, on a summer wonderful day looking up, you see faces and dogs and cats and kittens and shapes in the clouds. You always see faces in the clouds, but you never see clouds in faces. That's because we have, we're really good. Humans are extremely good at finding patterns in things. So we found this pattern that seems to be there, but it isn't. So astrology is just simply a trick. It's a way of saying when things are, when things are happening. And so, oh yes, you, you were born when Mars was ascended. Well, you can't argue with that, but there is no meaning to that. There is no influence to that. So today we now know that if two astrologers, you ask five astrologers your opinion, you're going to get 17 opinions. So no, they don't agree with each other. They have no way of agreeing with each other. But that's where astrology was born. Astrology was born by the extensive study of the behavior and movement of the planets and the motions of the star, of these wandering stars. So Let's give it some credit where credit is due because it kept people looking at the sky and it was very important to determine calendars. All right, so if we look at the sky and we try to determine what's up there and how it moves, we naturally want to come up with some sort of explanation for it. And that explanation that seems to be the most rational is the geocentric model. Not rational by what it really is, but rational by our experience. And rational by experience means we simply don't feel the earth moving underneath us. And there's other arguments as well that the ancients used to actually justify geocentrism and actually beat down heliocentrism in its nascent, in its nascent beginnings. But let's actually look at that for just a second, because this is a very interesting set of arguments. All right. So... In a geocentric model, meaning the Earth is at the center of the cosmos, this philosophy held that the Earth was at the center. Well, why did Aristotle, who was around from about 380 BC to about 320 BC, why did he come up with that the Earth, the Earth must be still, that it must not be moving? Well, he used a number of arguments. And his first argument was, where's the wind? <laughs> The wind, if the Earth was moving, well, where's the catastrophic winds of us moving through the cosmos? All right, that's a good argument. Where's the wind? Second, let's say you take an arrow, and they had archers back then. You take an arrow and shoot it straight up. Where does the arrow fall? The arrow falls straight back down at your feet. If the Earth were moving, then the Earth should move out from underneath the arrow and fall to the ground. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. Why doesn't it do that? It doesn't do that because the Earth's not moving, or so Aristotle thought. Third, we can turn it around the other way. Build a tall building, go to the top of a tall cliff, and if you drop a rock, the rock, if the Earth was moving, or rotating for that matter, because everybody at the time knew it was round, didn't know how big it was until a hundred years later in Aristarchus's world, in Aristotle's world, if you, the, if the Earth should then move away from it. And the rock would not plummet all the way to the ground to the base of the cliff, but will drift either towards the cliff if the cliff is to the east, or to away from the cliff if away from the cliff is to the east if the Earth is rotating. All right. Now that's a very interesting set of argument based on Coriolis. The next argument against geocentrism, or, or for geocentrism, which is interesting of it itself, is parallax. Uh, Aristotle reasoned that if you don't see parallax in the sky then therefore the Earth cannot be moving. And this is, as we've described before, an extremely difficult measurement to make and wasn't even accomplished until the 1830s 
well over 2,000 years after Aristotle's death. So we can forgive him for not seeing it because the stars are extremely far away. All right. The next thing that he had, those are some funny little arguments. One argument said that, uh, that the earth was the heaviest thing. And so if it's the heaviest, it must go to the lowest point. And the lowest point must be at the center of everything because that's where the heaviest thing should lie is at the center. It's kind of a woo-woo argument, but we can, we can live with it. Uh, and then he also said, now here's an interesting thing. The stars move. Well, we see the stars moving. We don't see the earth moving. So therefore, the stars are moving. We're not moving. So we can look at Aristotle and think there's a smart guy who came up with a lot of reasons in 360 or 340 BC as to why the earth doesn't move. Now, remember, technology that we have today did not exist for him. So his ideas carried a huge amount of weight and tended to actually give, uh, tended to hold progress back for a very long period of time. All right, so then let's actually look at some other things. Why didn't people say that the sun was at the center? Didn't we just learn from the last lecture that the sun is 20 times bigger than, than the moon? And the, well, the 20, it's 20 times bigger than the moon, and the moon is, is half the size of the Earth, so it means it's, it's actually it's a huge, huge object. The sun's really big. If the sun's really big, shouldn't it be at the center? And people supported it, such as Parath P Pythagoras, sorry, Pythagoras of Pythagorean theorem. Yes, he deposited that the sun should be at the center. Well, why did he say that? It's because fire is nobler than earth. So therefore, fire should be at the center. Well, it's not very scientific. So uh, Pythagoras was known to be a little bit of a mystical woo-woo. And if we look up at the Pythagorean solids, they were actually kept secret because they thought that these things were, were powerful mystical forces. So Pythagoras wasn't so much a scientist as a, myth, um, as a mystic and a mathematician. So Aristotle's ideas held deep sway because he actually tried to reason through the nature of the cosmos. That he got it wrong, we can excuse because of technology and because we have modern technology that assists us in understanding things a little bit better. But his models worked and models that work stay put in science until there's something that breaks the model. And that's the important thing that occurred later. But let's actually find how we can build a model. In 140 AD, uh, about 500 years, almost 500 years after, or 400 years after uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, mathematician, uh, Claudius Ptolemaeus, wrote his Almagest, and the Almagest was an enormous, enormous undertaking where he plotted the charts of the heavens and tried to determine how things actually move. And so he created a model of the cosmos, the geocentric model that held sway for almost six, for a thousand years, actually 1500 years, all the way up through Galileo's time and beyond, that the earth was at the center. So this is an incredibly important thing. So let's see, what did he do? Okay, so first, uh, Ptolemy posited along with Aristotle that the earth was at the center. Alrighty, so then he, he wanted to see how things move. So he created a coordinate system, the, uh, the equatorial coordinate system, which is the right ascension and declination, and he used the right ascension and declination of the stars and planets to determine the positions. Yep, that's where that coordinate system comes from. It comes from 140 AD. That's an old, old, old coordinate system. Anyway, so what did he do? He posited that around, that around that the Earth is at the center, and in order to see both the prograde motion and the retrograde motion of the planets, here's what he posited must occur. Every planet must be embedded in some orb, and the orb must be made of some ether. And this ether is in a circle that surrounds the Earth. And embedded in that orb of ether, the, uh, the planet rides on a circular orbit called a deferent, a deferent. The deferent is actually the orbit that it rides upon. And it's a perfect circle. Now, the, star, the planet itself doesn't actually ride on the def deferent inside of the, or the ethereal orb. But what it does is it rides on an epicycle on top that's, that's centered on the deferent. So you've got this epicycle that's on the deferent. So this, as the planet goes around the Earth, it does these little loop-de-loops all the way around. So we got these little loop-de-loops. In addition to that, the Earth is not exactly at the center, but offset. 
And so the offset is offset by a little bit of distance, and each, each of the planets has a different offset from center of the Earth. So the Earth isn't truly at the center, according to Ptolemy. Well, it's actually, the center of it is actually between the Earth and a place called an equant. And an equant is, an, uh, is a place that's equidistant from the center. So he posited a little of the Earth here, equant is there, there's the center of the deferent. It rides around this deferent like this, and then it rides on epicycles around the deferent. It's a fairly complicated system, and every single planet had its own set of epicycles, deferents, and, and, and uh, equants. Every single one of them did. And the Earth was offset from the equants from each one of them. In fact, in order to, uh, to see the patterns of Mercury and Venus, Mercury and Venus had to have their, their deference ride in between the Sun and Earth. So it was an even odd thing because Venus was between the Earth and the Sun in order to always stay in the position of the sky that it, that it was seen in. All right, so this is a very complicated system. Um, we would look at this and say it's very complicated, extremely complicated, and the reason why almost nobody back then was a public speaker about astronomy, because it took years and years of work to really understand what the Almagest actually says and how to actually predict things using it. Remember, they didn't have mathematical equations that we do today, and so everything was done both geometrically and with huge tables. So they actually had to do tabular data of the positions of objects in the sky and note where they were over time. So it actually was an extraordinarily difficult undertaking in order to actually do this map. And Ptolemy's work was actually very important and still stays important. It stayed important all the way up through the latter part of the, of the 17th century. Uh, in fact, the, only with the advent of Tycho Brahe's data in the 17th century did we actually get to something where we could actually say, hey, this is really important and now we can actually break away. But how did we break away? All right, so fast forward through the Dark Ages, through the, the loss of, 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 the, of the fall of Rome, through the fall of Greece, uh, the knowledge of the Library of Alexandria propagated out through Western, from Western culture all the way through Islam, and, the, and it came back. Ptolemy's writings went from Greece into, translated into Arabic and came back to, uh, back to the West from those Arabic translations. And that is why it's called the Al-Magast, because it just means it's the table. The Al-Magast, I believe in Arabic, means the great tables. In any event, this tabular data that was created for the geocentric material pro proved to be its own undoing because of the nature of what it predicted and how it predicted it. And next time, we'll talk about the heliocentric model and how the sun was actually shown to be at the center. See you soon.